Europe's answer to Starship starts testing, NASA finds a new moon, and iSpace tests China's first Methalox reusable rocket prototype. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 3rd of November, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. NASA's Lucy spacecraft flew by asteroid Dinkanish this past Wednesday, but the encounter had a really interesting twist. Dinkanish, which NASA believed to be just one asteroid, is actually two asteroids orbiting each other. The discovery was made thanks to Lucy's tracking camera that imaged the pair of asteroids as it flew by them at a relative speed of 4.5 kilometers per second. This flyby was performed as a test of the spacecraft systems, and it was done to demonstrate that it's capable of tracking asteroids as it flies by them at relatively high speeds. In fact, this flyby was expected to be the hardest of all the ones NASA has planned for Lucy, since Stinkanish is the smallest of the bodies that it's set to fly past during its primary mission. But even when things are just meant for testing, discoveries can be made, and Lucy did just that. While this is not the first binary asteroid system that we know of by a long shot, it is so far the smallest one found in the main asteroid belt, and it certainly has some resemblance to the near-Earth asteroid binary Didymos and Dimorphos that NASA's DART mission visited last year. Up next for Lucy will be another Earth flyby in December of 2024, followed by a flyby of asteroid 52246 Donald Johansson in April of 2025. We'll have to wait a bit for that, but one can only imagine how many more discoveries Lucy could make. China's Shenzhou-16 mission has returned to Earth with its crew of three after a five-month stay at the Tiangong space station. Undocking of the Shenzhou-16 from the Nader docking port of the Tianhe module occurred on October 30th at 1237 UTC. This was followed about 12 hours later by the landing of the descent capsule at 11 minutes past midnight UTC on October 31st in the Gobi Desert. On board Shenzhou-16 were astronauts Jinghai Pong, Zhu Yangju, and Guihai Chao. The three were part of the fifth long-duration expedition to the Tiangong Station, having logged 153 days, 22 hours, and 41 minutes of flight time during this mission. The commander of the mission, Jinghai Pong, has now also become China's most experienced astronaut, with four space flights under his belt and a total of 201 days of cumulative time in space. The return to Earth for Shenzhou-16 was successful, although there were a few quirks here and there. After the main parachute was deployed, it appeared as if a small fissure had developed on its canopy. This was also followed by a few rolls of the capsule right after touching down, which could have been due to wind. The astronauts were unharmed, however, as the capsule is designed to protect them in case this happens, but I don't know about you, I wouldn't be very happy to be rolling around like that after five months in zero-g. And now let's go from returning from space to launching into space by taking a look at This Week in Launches. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a Soyuz 2.1B rocket that took place on October 27th at 7.04 UTC from Site 43-4 at the Plesetsk Cosmodrome in Russia. This Soyuz rocket was carrying the 8th Lotos S1 satellite into low Earth orbit. The Lotos S1 series of satellites are part of Russia's Liana Electronic Intelligence Satellite System, and it appears that, based on space tracking data, another smaller satellite was deployed from the Lotos S1 spacecraft soon after launch. This is similar to the previous Lotos S1 spacecraft that launched about a year ago and also released a sub-satellite. This week, we also had the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 4 East in California on October 29th at 9 o'clock UTC. The rocket was carrying a batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. This launch broke the record for most Starlink V2 mini satellites launched from Vandenberg in a single flight, and it also broke the record turnaround time for SpaceX's West Coast launch pad. The new turnaround record now stands at 8 days and 37 minutes, having been brought down from the previous record of about 9.5 days. The first stage for this mission, B-1075, was flying for a seventh time and successfully landed on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. Another Falcon 9 launch took place on October 30th at 2320 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. It was carrying 23 Starlink V-2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1077, was flying for an eighth time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. With these two Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,376 satellites, of which 365 have re-entered, and 4,423 are now in operational orbit. 
From the other side of the globe, we also had the launch of a Chongzheng 6A rocket on October 31st at 2250 UTC from Launch Complex 9A at the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying a pair of Tianhui-5 cartographic satellites for the People's Liberation Army. Not a lot of details have been made public about these satellites, other than that the launch went well. This was the fourth launch of the Chongzheng 6A rocket and the second in the last two months. This week we also had another flight of Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 space plane. Takeoff of the VSS Unity under the center wing of the VMS Eve mothership took place on November 2nd at 1500 UTC. The mission lifted off from Spaceport America and is the fifth commercial flight for the company, hence its name Galactic 05, and the second research flight for VSS Unity. On board VSS Unity were Commander Mike Basucci, who was flying for a fifth time, and pilot Kelly Latimer, who was flying for a third time. The passengers for this flight were Dr. Alan Stern, Kelly Girardi, and Kenny Mason Rouge, all flying for their first time. Along with the passengers was also Virgin Galactic's astronaut instructor, Colin Bennett, who was flying for his third time. The mission, however, was not like some of the most recent ones from Virgin Galactic in that it wasn't just aimed at the enjoyment of the passengers. It also carried research payloads on board. While Ketty Mason Rouge was indeed a paying customer for this mission, Dr. Alan Stern and Kelly Girardi were flying as researchers for this flight and performed a few experiments while on board. Girardi, for example, flew with three payloads that had a healthcare research angle, one of them featuring the collection of biometric data during the flight. Dr. Stern also had a similar experiment in which a biomedical harness collected physiological data during the flight, in addition to another experiment which he performed during the mission. We recently had Dr. Stern on our NSF Live show, where he explained much more in depth what this experiment was all about. Astronomers have been using robotic suborbital vehicles all the way back to the 1950s to do this kind of stuff. If we can now do it, not once a year, but once a week, and if we can do it for 10 times less price per flight, right. that's the game change. When you do these observations, are you going to be just looking out the window? Like you're going to be shooting the observation through the window that's already on the spacecraft, or is there a special window they're installing for this? No, we're using the, the windows that are there. Okay. And we're actually taking a space shuttle experiment I was principal investigator for, and looking at the same star fields with the same instrument, the okay. only difference is instead of a space shuttle window and space shuttle attitude disturbances, it's a virgin window and virgin attitude. And we're going to see if virgin can do better or the same or not as well. And gotcha. little things matter in this. So you could calculate a lot of that. You could simulate it in a computer um, in, a, in a sort of perfect world environment. But what we, what we can't quantify are the things like the glints off the wings affecting the experiment or the microscopic scratches and films that come from the propulsive ascent that you don't have they're different every flight yep and, and so the only way to really find out is to go do the experiment bring the equipment look through the window at the same star fields that we did with a shuttle with the same instrument and compare the drop of unity from vms eve occurred about 44 minutes after takeoff at 1544. Our own Jack Byer was there at Spaceport America, capturing the drop and ignition of Spaceship 2's hybrid motor. The ascent and coast phase went well, and VSS Unity successfully glided down to the Spaceport America runway, touching down about 14 minutes after the drop at 1558 UTC. Jack was later able to head out to the crew and congratulate Dr. Stern in person. Hopefully he'll be able to come by our channel again soon and tell us all about his experience during the flight and the results of his experiment. And if you're hungry for even more launches, there are more on their way with the latest batch of missions assigned to SpaceX and ULA under the Space Force's National Security Space Launch Phase 2 contract, though NSSL Phase 2 is much shorter, so I'm just going to stick with that. This is, in fact, the last batch of contracts under NSSL Phase 2, and soon the Space Force will begin the process to open bids for the NSSL Phase 3 contracts. While the Phase 2 contracts were originally set to launch between 2022 and 2027, Phase 3 contracts will start launching around 2028, so there are still a few more years to go until we know more about those. This latest batch includes 21 missions, 11 going to ULA and 10 going to SpaceX. These launches include missions in support of the Space Development Agency Tranche 1 and Tranche 2 constellations, which we talked about a couple of months ago, as well as six missions for the National Reconnaissance Office. Of course, most of these missions are classified in nature, so there's not a lot that we know about most of them, but there are a few that we do know a bit about. For example, 
The USS F-25 mission, which has been assigned to ULA, will be carrying DARPA's Draco spacecraft to test nuclear thermal propulsion. This share of launches includes three more Falcon Heavy flights that will take place in the next few years. One of them will see the first launch of the next generation of GPS-3 satellites, the GPS-3F SV-01 satellite. If you remember, the first generation of GPS-3 satellites can be launched on the single-stick Falcon 9 rocket, but these are only inserted into a transfer orbit, meaning that it doesn't bring the satellite up to its final orbit. But the GPS-3F satellites will instead be inserted directly into their final orbit, about 20,000 kilometers above Earth, so the larger Falcon Heavy rocket will be needed. Of course, no one will complain about more Falcon Heavy launches though, am I right? It's always so cool to see those side boosters coming back down for a landing and having three bonus flights. It's really nice. This batch of launches also puts 11 more launches on Vulcan's already tight schedule in the next few years. The rocket has a bunch of other Space Force launches from previous batches of NSSL Phase 2 mission assignments, but it also has commercial launches, like the dozens to support the deployment of Amazon's Kuiper constellation. Like with Falcon Heavy, you definitely won't be hearing any complaints about the number of launches, though. Jack would say, more rockets, more better. And while I'm clearly not Jack, I couldn't agree more. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Astrobotics Peregrine Lander has finally arrived at the Cape and is being readied for launch on Vulcan's first flight. While that's happening, the rocket is being stacked at the launch site with the booster and solid rocket motors having already been integrated together. Next up will be the delivery of the Centaur 5 upper stage from ULA's factory out to the Cape, where it'll be integrated with the rest of the rocket before launch. That launch, still set for December 24th, now has a liftoff time of 1.49 a.m. local time, or 6.49 UTC, so it'll probably be pretty chilly for Vulcan's first flight. Better make sure you dress accordingly. We've got you covered with our brand new NSF holiday merchandise. It's here, guys! We've got real knitted sweaters and beanies to rep all things spaceflight with a fun wintertime twist. Show your support for Crew Dragon, ring in the season with our Raptor Christmas tree design, or celebrate on the surface of Mars with an updated re-release of our popular design from last year. We've also got t-shirts and mugs with these designs too. But don't delay, be sure to order by November 20th for guaranteed delivery by Christmas. Head on over to shop.nasaspaceflight.com to check them out. Blue Origin has unveiled its Blue Moon MK-1 lander, a cargo lander that will serve as the prototype vehicle for the company's Blue Moon MK-2 lander, which will be Blue's human landing system for NASA's Artemis program. This cargo lander is capable of carrying three tons to the lunar surface, fits with a New Glenn 7-meter diameter payload fairing, and it can be sent to the moon in one single flight. The MK-1 lander shown is, of course, just a mock-up, but that won't last for long. According to the company, the first Blue Moon MK-1 lander is set to fly on one of the first few flights of New Glenn. This first one will just be a demonstration mission, but subsequent flights will be available for purchase by commercial customers to land their payloads on the lunar surface. Ariane Group has started subscale testing of its reusable upper stage vehicle, Suzy. This reusable upper stage concept, unveiled in September of last year, is similar to SpaceX's Starship in that it launches as part of a rocket stage, deploys a payload into orbit, and then lands from orbit to be reused again. In fact, it re-enters belly first, just like Starship. Also like Starship, it could serve to fly people or deliver cargo to space stations. But the similarities end there, as Suzy is much smaller than Starship at only 5 meters wide and 12 meters long. Also, Starship's first stage is reusable, while Suzy would fly on the fully expendable Ariane 6 rocket. With this initial subscale testing, Ariane Group has gone from announcement to actual testing in just about a year, which is quite surprising for a more traditionally inclined rocket company. The subscale vehicle has aerodynamic fins and a rocket engine for ascent and descent control, and it's set to perform hop tests in the next year or two. So, maybe we'll see a full-scale article fly sooner rather than later. Starship is one step closer to launch with the latest closeout of paperwork from the FAA. On October 31st, the agency announced that it had completed the safety review portion of the launch license for Starship. This review started in early September with the completion of the mishap investigation from the first flight. With this safety review now complete, the FAA has signed off on the 63 corrective actions that SpaceX identified that it needed to perform ahead of Starship's second flight. The
The only part remaining now is the environmental review of the license, which is currently being performed by the FAA in consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Once this environmental review is completed, the FAA will be able to proceed with the modification of Starship's launch license and subsequent launch approval. So, it may very well be that we are just a few weeks away from Starship's next launch. iSpace has performed a successful hop of its Hyperbola 2 test vehicle from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. The short 178-meter hop was the first test flight of this prototype vehicle, which aims to validate the propulsion and guidance technologies needed for the company's larger and partially reusable Hyperbola 3 launch vehicle. The Hyperbola 3 rocket, set to debut in 2025, is planned to be able to carry over 8 tons to low Earth orbit in reusable configuration and over 13 in expendable configuration. This was also China's first test of a Methalox reusable rocket. And now let's take a look at what's coming up next week in spaceflight. P.S. It's all mostly Falcon 9. Yep, four Falcon 9 launches are coming up next week, the first of which is set to carry another batch of Starlink satellites. Liftoff is set to occur on November 3rd at 2230 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40. And by the way, that's just later today, so be sure to tune into our live coverage of the launch. That mission will be extra exciting, as it'll feature the first time a Falcon 9 booster is flying for its 18th time. This will be followed by another Starlink launch set to take place from the same launch pad on November 8th, a few hours after midnight UTC. From the other coast of the United States, another Falcon 9 will be taking off on November 9th, carrying SpaceX's ninth transporter mission as part of the company's small sat rideshare program. Liftoff is set to occur within a 96-minute window that opens at 1847 UTC. And to wrap up the week, another Falcon 9 will be taking off from Launch Complex 39A, carrying SpaceX's 29th resupply mission to the ISS. Liftoff is set to occur on November 10th at 128 UTC. If it launches on that day, docking to the front docking port of the ISS Harmony module is set to occur on November 11th at 1020 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.